அல்ஹம்தன்னும் குடை இருப்பான் அல்ஹம்தன்னும் குடை விருப்பான் அல்ஹம்தன்னும் குடை விரிப்பான் அதற்குள்ளே தானவன் இருப்பான் அதற்குள்ளே தானவன் இருப்பான் மை லவ் யூ மை லவ் யூ மை லவ் யூ சன்ஸ் மை லவ் யூ சன் மை லவ் யூ டோட்டர்ஸ் மை லவ் யூ டோட்டர்ஸ் கமிங் 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 நம் பிதாவை காண போவோம் நம் பிதாவை காண போவோம் போகும் 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 தேடாத தேட்டெல்லாம் தருவான் திருலோகமும் நம்மை அழைத்து செல்வான் திருலோகமும் நம்மை அழைத்து செல்வான் அன்பான அருள்பால் தருவான் நம் ஆனந்த பசியை தீட்ட ஆனந்தமான பசியின் தீட்ட In the name of the compassion and mercy of God, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The story I'm going to tell will seem to be a worldly story, but it's the story of the guidance of the Sheikh to his disciple in many ways that the disciple cannot know initially. Um will not know what exactly is going on but now all these years later i have understood better in some um, miraculous unfolding of events i ended up going back to sri lanka with bao in 1972 and the family that had come with him and by my understanding here was the one i thought would be my understanding there i'm a student i'm to be as awake as i possibly could be to understand whatever would be given but when i got there uh, it became the arabian nights it was an astonishment after astonishment and i who had come as a truly submissive a student was being reversed into someone who actually ha- I practiced my walk in front of a mirror so that 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 when I walked into the room where Bawa was I would be the person that he was now setting me up to be that I had no idea about and instead of this you know the suppliant supplicant student I became Uh, larger than life truly in the way in which he was describing me to others and now I was running to catch up to be this thing mm, certainly never understanding and uh one day he did two things there was the refusal of my presence in the room which absolutely floored me i had no idea why that was going on but he sent me out to tea as many times as i can remember and i really got a stab in my heart when that happened i said i've come a half a world away to learn wisdom and i'm not allowed to stay in the room long enough to learn wisdom <laughs> well with that the inner knower which has always been present for me said you're foolish this man loves you so much whatever is happening is a lesson and with that i surrendered that and stayed in these wonderful quarters that had been allotted to me in um i means house um it was like two special rooms and a bath and and i entertained all the ladies but one day down the hall with his shawl wafting in the breeze came bawa to join me at breakfast as though i was a guest in his house and he came and he just brought pleasantries he had a translator i sat there in this totally elevated state <laughs> again the, the i guess in, in the in the learning of the understanding of life on the path is to not predict anything just take what comes do the best that you can with it and this was like an honor beyond all honors the breakfast being concluded he asked me if he could take his leave i gave him leave to leave <laughs> and that was an episode 
After we had done his work uh, in Colombo, there was a, an airplane that was taken to Jaffna, and in Jaffna, it became even more. I mean, it was just ridiculous how amazing this was. There was music on the tarmac when we arrived in the airplane. There were two thrones, so to speak, on the tarmac, beautiful chairs. Um, given, I was given two scepters that were made of fruits and flowers and perfume things and finally ended with two little gilt crowns at the end of it, which I stood, sat beside him. Uh, which also unsettled me. You know our, our position uh, has always been that Bauer was up and we were down, and we liked it. I mean, that was, it was appropriate because that's how we felt. And now here were the chairs, they were even. And at that point, I really, uh, I'm not a person who faints, but that was the moment that I thought, really, that's the end. I could not really bear it. Then we got into the cars, and it was a parade through, through the little town. Uh, Four Nudemann's guards were at every street, and at every house there was a little table with uh, water. We were presented with the water and the perfumed water to be sprinkled with, and uh, lays upon lays, you know, garlanding and garlanding. And it was more than a human being could really take. I mean, it's easier to take it from the Arabian Nights as a book than it is as a person. And when we finally came to the ashram, the ashram was so crowded with people that when we got in, we couldn't see the daylight. It was that thick with people. And so my life began in Jaffna. Well, all of that it seemed to be what I kept on saying, I've come here to be a student. When will I learn? What is it that I'm supposed to be learning? But Bawa had known that what I would eventually remember out of this is the way that he was the father and the person that people looked up to, the people who respected him and the way that had to be. He had given me a title here. It was a title that I needed instruction on. He wasn't going to sit down and say, now this is what you do when you're president, this is how you're presidential, and this is what you do, I called you ama, and this is how you be a mother. No, it wasn't like that. I will never forget these scenes of Bauer ministering to all of the people, doing all of the correct and loving and uh, insightful things, but at the same time, keeping my own understanding of what it is to be in a certain state of elevation for the sake of the people who are coming to you for some advice, for some comfort. All of that has to be given from that station. And now when I amuse myself into the thought of it, I think of the tremendous work that actually came out of the Arabian Nights how many times I can refer back to that knowledge and understand that in fact he was preparing me for a life here which would be full of responsibility and correct ways. And I watched him in all of his correct ways. Alhamdulillah. This is a very simple story, um, which I understood much later or when it, when it was over. But our stories you understand when it's over. I mean, when the event has happened. And it was one in my earlier years. I traveled all the time from Connecticut. I lived in Stanford, Connecticut, and I traveled to Philadelphia. And I would travel every other Saturday or so. And it was a busy life because I had a full-time job. And then Saturday, Friday night, I would travel. And if you know the traffic jams around New York City going over the bridges out of the town, it's, it's quite a ride. But all the rides I took for, for ma many, since 1973 to 1986, never an accident happened. I was never alone. He didn't like you to travel alone, but by virtue, I was a single person. I, I traveled all by myself most of the time. And never anything happened. I didn't get a flat tire or didn't lose anything. So that was already amazing to me, and I was very sure it was Bauer watching out for me. Then one, one of the things that happened was that for a while Bauer had here in Philadelphia, he sold little uh, hangers with an Allah sign, I don't know if you recall that. 
and he uh, it was I think twenty dollars a piece, and we would sell it for a money making uh, event. So I was here on a weekend. It was a long weekend, and I thought I can sell things, you know. So I took a little bag and I sold twenty pieces and had more time. I said I can sell some more, and I asked the girl to give me another little bag, and I sold I think another five. And then I had to go home, and I came to Paris, took my leave, and I handed him the fifteen left over science bag. And he said to me, he, he saw it, and he said to me, you never return to the good what he once gave to you. So it was the first lesson. So I said, I, have to say, I said, what do I do with Zimbabwe? He said, sell him. <laughs> and he, I said, well, I could try and sell him in Stanford. There were not that many fellowship people, and he didn't know who would buy all that signs from me, but he told me, sell him. So I went and I... Sold them. I sold them to friends, relatives, uh, to myself, to my kids. <laughs> but when I came back after two or three weeks, I had the three hundred dollars to give to him, and I was really proud of myself, you know, because I wasn't making that much money, and it wasn't that easy. But here I had this money for Bauer. I was, you know, you're proud of yourself. So I gave, gave him, gave him the money, and then he said, "Oh, my daughter, you keep it." I said, "Bauer, I don't need it." I said, you need it for the fellowship. I didn't sell it for myself. And he said to me the same words. He said, you don't give back to the guru what he gave to you. I said, all right, he gave it to me. He said, what did I do with it? Uh, I save it. I keep it. We went home. And that time, I was traveling with Veronica and Denise and somebody else in the car. The car had four people in it. And we traveled, and everything was going really fine. And then we came to the front of the George Washington Bridge as the last toll booth is a big one. There is a, a big uh, a station, stopping station to go with it. And my car went to the toll booth. It didn't start. And we wanted to pull off from the toll booth. It didn't start. And whatever we tried, it didn't start. There came a big truck by, and he said, do you have trouble, lady? I'll, I'll take you. And he towed me into the station, gas station. And what was the problem? I had my alternator had given up, and I had to leave the car. And we had to go to Stanford, and somebody had to come with the car and pick us up. It was like, like a little bit busy, but it was no accident. It was like we were all safe. We had stopped in the toll booth, didn't hit anybody. And we made it a joke because here came a big, they rented a Cadillac to pick us up. And we all went home in a big Cadillac, and we had come in a little car, so we had fun. But after a week, I just still didn't have my car. I had to leave it behind. So after a week, I called and found out from the garage what was with my car. And after a week, I could pick the car up, and I came and got it. And guess what the bill was? $300. And it was overpaid because, you know, an alternator doesn't cost $300. So I came to Philadelphia driving my little car. I said, Anne, how are you? <laughs> and I, I just kissed his hand. But that's how a teacher teaches. He takes care of you. And you, you won't get to a bad spot in your, in your life. But you have to learn and see what you have to do. And it teaches me more things now. Thank you.
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. One night, um, when Ba was in the physical form, I was in this room, or I, I entered the room, and Michael Green was uh, telling a story. Bawa had asked him um, to just come up, speak, a, to tell a wisdom story. He was doing this on a, on a night on a nightly basis, he was having uh, people tell stories of wisdom. And for some reason, as soon as I came in the room, I, I was struck with the thought, well, what story would I tell if Bawa were to ask me to tell a wisdom story? And, and my mind went absolutely blank. I couldn't think of a single Bawa story. Well, well what I actually thought was the thing to do is rather than make up a story of wisdom, to tell one of your father's stories. And, and then that's what happened. I, my mind went totally blank. I couldn't think of any story that Bao had ever told me. And so I started searching my memory. And uh, I got very self-conscious and thinking that for some odd reason he was going to call on me within minutes and demand that I, I, I start this story. Finally, I vaguely remembered the story of the Sheikh and the huh. disciples at the river, and uh, and I, but I just couldn't remember the details of it. And he, in the midst of my struggling, suddenly I saw Bawa turn his head. He turned his head, looked over at me, and and just nodded slowly. And then he turned back. And it was looking straight ahead, and several minutes later, Michael Green had finished his story, and Bawa started talking, and it turns out that he started to tell the exact story of the guru, uh, the sheikh, and the people that followed him. There's only one person that, that actually will follow the sheikh across, right on the sheikh's back and across the river, whereas most of the other people are attracted by the gold pots that are gold and copper pots that are by the side of the river. And he, he told the story so beautifully. And afterwards, I was so filled with awe and, uh, and really excitement at having that connection that I started doing zikr and I did it. It was a very deep experience, uh, but most remarkable in that uh, suddenly I felt a it was like a tractor beam. It was like a physical uh, a beam of energy between Bao and I. It, would t it felt so tangible that you couldn't have cut it with a knife if you'd tried. It just felt so strong. And uh, it lasted for uh, a good time. And it lasts in my memory still. Three days after Bao returned from Ceylon, like I said, in the summer of 1978, and I was in the girls' room, uh, I was upstairs doing zikr. And at that time, I had the practice of uh, doing the silent zikr in the meeting room every afternoon when I would return from work during the school year for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And so this was my practice, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon would be the time that I would take this time to do the zikr. And that's what I was doing in the girls' room. And after about 45 minutes or so, I was tired. So I decided I would just lay down and rest, which I did. During the time that I was doing that, I did continue to say the zikr silently. And as I was resting and meditating, suddenly it it became apparent that, you know how you feel when you go through a train, on a train through a tunnel, and you can feel the motion of the train moving and making that noise and rushing through the tunnel, but you can't see anything. All the lights go out and everything's dark, but you can feel the momentum of moving through the tunnel. That's what was occurring. Suddenly, all of a sudden, I was simply aware that that momentum was occurring, and I could see nothing around me, and I didn't know what was happening. And I'm saying the zikr, la ilaha illa la ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la. And I'm holding on to it because I'm not sure what's occurring. And I'm thinking to myself as this is going on, 
am I dying? Maybe I'm dying. So I continue to say the zikr uh, as firmly as I can, as rapidly as I can. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Because I figure whatever is happening, I want to end up in Allah. Please bow, you know, that's where I want to end. I don't know where I'm going, but this is where I want to return. And as I'm saying the zikr to myself silently, suddenly I become aware that in the midst of this darkness and this movement, I am aware of this momentum, this movement, that like a, a window shade opening, I can now see. And I'm looking down. And as I look down, I see a big tree and long picnic tables underneath it and a big family having like a reunion or whatever. And I look at the people and none of them are familiar and this doesn't mean anything to me per se. So I continue to say the zikr very firmly, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha And I continue forward. Suddenly, just as suddenly as I'm now seeing, I begin to hear. And I'm listening. What is it that I'm hearing? And I realize what I'm hearing is the kalima. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. As I'm saying it, I'm now being kind of bombarded both with vision and sound. So I'm still repeating this as firmly as I can and as rapidly as I can. And I now hear the kalima as well. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. So I'm saying it and I'm now hearing it. And as I'm continuing, I realize it's a little bit distracting, you know, with the, the input. So I must hold on very firmly and I'm holding on as firmly as I can. And in the midst of all of this, which is all probably seconds, I suddenly become aware that the kalima that I'm listening to is not being heard by my ears. This is something that's occurring throughout my entire body. This is not a sound, this is a resonance. This is that resonance of Allah, which Bawa speaks of, where every atom, every molecule, every cell was reciting. And I became aware that I was that witness or that awareness within the Kalima, which was recognizing the reality, the truth, which Bawa has always spoken of, how he said that except for you, Muhammad, I would not have created anything. And it's that affirmation, the remembrance of God, which sustains all creation. And how he'd say that the scientists um, will never be able to cut the atom. As many times as they can cut it, they will never get to that essence which sustains life, which is the kalima. And that's what I was experiencing. I was within that point of truth which sustains all creation, which is the kalima, the zikr, la ilaha illallah. There's nothing, oh God, except for you. As I'm becoming aware of what is occurring, I have the thought, will I ever return? And as quickly as the thought came, suddenly I could see myself laying on my little bed in the girls' room. And I was moving at a very fast speed. I was coming really fast. And the momentum with which I was moving felt like it would like just push its way you know, straight through the body. And yet, as soon as it came to the body, it entered it. And suddenly, I heard my mother's voice from the doorway, which I realized it, it's, it came to me as how we each come into this world through that opening from within our mothers and that the mother beckoning brought me back to this world or brought me into this world of creation. And I had returned. So I sat up and was, you know, truly awestruck, wondering, you know, how, how, how did this happen? Uh, what does this mean on the path? And even though I knew the reality of the experience, it was interesting that I felt that I needed to go to Bawa and tell him about it, even though I realized um, he knew. So I spoke maybe the next day to Dr. Ajwat, who was the translator, and I explained that I wanted to share this experience with Bawa, and I did. And as I was describing it, Bawa sat up very straight, and he looked at me very firmly, and he listened, and he nodded his head. He said, very good. Very good, Rambanalam, Rambanalam, Rambanalam. He said, 
very, very good. And he listened and he took it all in. When I got to the point where I explained that, I wasn't sure if I'd ever come back again, and it was the thought that brought me back. He said, don't worry. He said, it happens like that. Sometimes it happens like that. Just keep doing it. After I explained the whole experience, he said, that's very, very good. He says, that's the correct way to do the zikr. He said, continue to do it like that. Now, I realized at the point that it occurred that that was a gift given, and that what we need to do is make that intention to continue to do the zikr, and then whatever is given as a gift, as a secret, as the parting of the veils, to whatever extent that we're showing what exists in reality, it's God's work. Um, but the clue was that Bawa had said to me, that's the correct way to do it, do it like that. Continue to do it like that. So I, I went back and I started to reflect, well, what was I doing? And what dawned on me was that I had been focusing on the arsh and actually the kursi. How Bawa told us in the zikr book that we should look, you know, down la ilaha, like with the corner of our eye, la ilaha, illa and then follow that, you know, with the movement of the eyes. But actually at that time, I had laid down and I was envisioning this opening, the clarity and the opening of that conduit or channel going all the way up to that point in the arsh. And actually, as I was laying there, I was looking with the eyes straight here, kind of holding it in check between these two points. And in holding the eyes in position there, repeating la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. But envisioning that opening in which one could leave. And I believe that that is what indeed occurred that that traveling took place by leaving and, and, and moving forward, up and out. And so in that way, I, I humbly share it with all of us that uh, this is our Father's work, and it's a gift given to us. And as we intend Him, He will receive us. And however, this may be given to each of us in the right time, in the right way. The one point that I remembered after I, I sat up that afternoon was that it's only the mind separating us from this reality right now, this instant, right now. Every atom is resonating. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. It is sustaining all creation. Every aspect is in that state of prayer. And if we can just go beyond the mind, it's happening now. You know, right now. So may we join within God's truth and unite with Him. Amen. What will fade you? What will it do? Will it let me find the divine bliss of my birthright? Will it make me argue like a fool? What will fate do to me? What will it do? Will it let me find the divine bliss of my birthright? Will it make me argue like a fool? Will it lead me to ridicule at the hands of dancing girls? Will it put me in the company of men with divine luminous wisdom? What will fate do to me? What will it do? Will it let me speak to the silent one? Will it make me wander all over the world? Will it make me run to distant lands? Will it 
This is the story of uh, my coming to greet Bala and the birth of my second son, Jalal Dean. Well, it was after a discourse, and I came to greet Bala, and he looked at me. I was pregnant maybe four or five months into the pregnancy, and he looked at me and said, don't worry, everything, I've been to your birth and everything is going to be all right. Increase your faith. And I, for a moment I thought, did he mean, what, what birth did he mean? My first son or <laughs> the baby I was about to have? And he said, don't worry, um, I, everything will be all right. And so I took that blessing and of course thought about it, but knew that it would be all right, and then uh, went to, with full faith, went to have the child, and this is what happened. Mm. Well, uh, Moon, Moon's conversation with Bawa, uh, I recall you recounted it to me at the time, and how strange it was that he said, I was there and it will be all right. And we didn't know, we discussed it, and we didn't know whether the translation had been strange, or she had not heard it correctly, or what was the meaning of this. In any case, uh, with faith, of course, we looked forward to the birth, and uh, Moon went into a very long labor. Uh, this is in the winter of 1986. She went into a very long labor, very difficult labor, and uh, anyone who's ever been at a birth in a state of prayerfulness knows that there's it's almost like entering into entering into the to the mystery. It is it is one of the mysteries, the birth of a, of of another soul. So I was very deep in prayer, and and uh, saw in my inner heart that Moon was dying, and I saw in my inner heart that the child was also dying. And I was praying as profoundly as I could. And I then went and uh, demanded to see the physician, the attending physician, and was told by the nurse, one of the nurses, that she was busy delivering two other babies at the same time, and that they were very understaffed that day, they were very overwhelmed, and that this would be a hardship to get the physician. And I, I said, you must get the physician and some of the attending nurses were some of our sisters in the fellowship, and they thought I was being a little bit aggressive and that my qualities were lacking. But I felt very certain that this was what needed to be done and, and was very aggressive and uh, persistent. And they got the doctor, and the doctor came, and I, st I informed her right away that I was an attorney and that um, 
and, there, and then she, that she should really pay attention to me and that I would immediately sign whatever releases were necessary to do whatever medical procedures would be necessary to, to save my wife and the child. And she looked at the situation and looked at all of the, you know, the dials on these machines and said, this is very serious, but it's not critical, and I'm delivering these other babies, so I really ha I cannot do anything right now. And she started to leave the room, and I said, no, tell me when does it become critical that I can observe these dials, because this is very serious. I know inside me how serious this is. The doctor was very sort of taken aback at the certitude and the clarity of tell me so she showed me on the dial, if this, if this get, dial gets to this number, then we must operate. She left a few minutes later. It was there, and I demanded that the nurse go and get the doctor. The doctor walked in, looked at it, and said, Sir, I, I usually, when we do a C-section, it's very, we can plan it, it's, there's, it's somewhat cosmetic, but this is an emergency, and we're just going to have to cut her right like this and take the baby out as quickly as possible. Is that okay? Yes. Then she said, and I have, some other, I have something else to request of you. We're short of staff. You're going to have to help. So now we, very, it all happened very quickly. We go into the room, and I'm seeing her going in my inner perception, the perception that you see when you look through the heart of the, the teacher, the guru, the sheikh, the, the guide, you can see. And, and uh, it's very traumatic. I mean, I, you, you, you can see when a, when a being is going. And we rush in, and it happened so fast, the doctor took a knife and just cut Moon open and pulled the baby out and then handed the baby to me. So I was holding the baby and it, having that, um, that amazing experience of the ecstasy of the wonder of birth and simultaneously seeing my first operation with, you know, with, with my best friend and you know, my, my beloved wife and seeing her cut open and I'd never seen anything like that. So simultaneously my heart was leaping to heaven and my knees were going hollow. I mean, I was, and I was almost passing out. It was just a, such a stretch. So they cut the umbilical cord, and, <laughs> and then I sat down, and I, the, the nurses came, and I sat down, and I could pray, and I composed myself, and Moon was taken to her room, and the baby was fine. Everything was fine. The doctor was so happy. The fellowship sisters who were nurses were so happy. I was so happy. I jogged from Booth. Memorial, a block away, I jogged here, came running up to Bawa's room. Bawa was sitting right here on the bed. I came running in and I said, thank, he said, how are you? And I, I was very, very elated. And I said, thank God, Bawa, thank God, thank God, thank you so much. Moon is okay, the baby is okay, everything is okay. I, I, I Thank God. And he looked at me and he said, it, which was not his nature. He usually would amplify. If you would praise God, he would take it to a higher level. If you would bring wisdom, he would always take it up. Because this was so unlike him, he was very nonplussed. And he looked at me and he said, well, I, I told you what would happen. Didn't, I, didn't they tell you? I told you what would happen. I know it's okay. Didn't they tell you? So I was really taken aback by this. I said, no, Bawa, they didn't tell me. And then, uh, and then, and then he, was, he, you know, he, was, he himself was not very well at that time. He was very frail. And so I, and he needed to rest, and I left. And I asked people, and I found out that a few weeks earlier, he had come out of an early morning meditation and then recounted this story to one of the translators and, and instructed them to tell us about it. And in Bawa's story, he was at the birth of this child with Moon, and that Moon went into distress and in fact died in the vision. And then the child also died along with the mother. 
and that Bawa had gone into the world of the unseen, into the world of the souls, to revive them. And that when he was there, he also was taken. And that he then prayed to God that my wife and this child had service and work to do in this formation and that they should be saved and that he had a little bit more work to do because it was only a little while after that that he relinquished service with his body that he still had more work to do to serve with his body and that he prayed to God to allow that service to continue and that he had told this story about how traumatic this birth was and how serious it would be, but that it would ultimately be all right. And he had told this openly to people to tell me. And they hadn't told me because they were concerned that it would be so upsetting to us that, that, uh, that they, and they didn't feel comfortable telling it. So when he had said to her, I was there and it will be all right, he meant it quite literally. And when one, is in a st and when one is in a state of authentic prayer, one can see these things. He knew it would be all right. I only knew how severe it was by looking inside. I could only see the inner story as it was unfolding. That's the student. But the master knows the unfoldment of the story. The student we have to go into the heart and know our children from within the heart and know our spouses from within the heart and know our brothers and sisters from within the heart and know this birth from within the heart and have confidence that our guide knows the present and knows the outcome. And he says to us, he says to us, and he said it to us so many ways, if we will but do this, we will know it. He has said it to us so many ways. I was there, and it will be all right. May each of us be there and know the perfection of God's blessing for all of us. Amen. To all 
trust you to all who live in this world. You are the one who can heal the suffering of the sinner. Um, well, when I was little, um, I was in bed and um, my parents heard me um, crying. So they went upstairs and when they were almost to the landing, like right where my room was, um, they heard me laughing. So they went inside and um, they asked me what uh, had happened. And, um, and they told them that Bauer had came in and held my hand. Once I was sitting in Bauer's room on the right side of the bed if you were sitting the way I was, on the right side of the bed, and um, I was in my dad's lap. I was about like seven or six or seven or something, and um, or just turned eight or something like that. And um, I was in a weird position, but my hand was like this, and it just stayed like this. And um, and then my dad moved, and I'm like, don't move. I feel like Bawa is holding my hand. Do you remember, like, being, you know, in Bawa's room, you know, when you got a little bit older and could walk around and stuff? Mm-hmm. Did another time when I came in, mm -hmm. Bawa said, whenever you, you need me, just call for me. He, he's very, I would say he's fair. Fair. Mm -hmm. And nice. Mm -hmm. And he, and very good, mm -hmm. and, he do, and he never does bad things. I remember once when I was, um, I think it was like three or four years old, I, I was sort of shy around him, I didn't really know him, and I asked him, are you God? And he said, um, no, I'm not a God, I'm, I'm, I, I'm nowhere near God, God is too high, I, I would never be able to even compare to him. And I, and I said, but you look like him. That's and he said, sweet. well, God made me in a way um, that made all, God made his creations all look like him. He wasn't trying to change us. He was trying to show us the belief that would get us where, though we didn't know it, we wanted to go. And each person could take or leave what he gave. And I guess what, I, what struck me then was that he would never force us into something that we didn't want to be in. You know, it wasn't, oh dear God, here I am, you know, please accept me. It was, gee, this is neat, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Who can I do it again, you know? When I was young, I did feel totally comfortable being with him and, and sort of knowing when, uh, in what way I should respect Bawa. Um, it wasn't, there was never a point when I was younger where I felt I had to figure it out and say, oh, well, what am I supposed to do now? Um, so there was, you know, there'd be talks sometimes where he would, I remember one, one talk he gave where um, he was talking about a well and how a well can look um, like clear, fresh water and you drink it and, and you can die and you can't drink that water. And, and he pointed out that you can't, the ocean, you can't drink the water in the ocean. And I quickly raised my hand and said, wow, you can drink the water in the ocean. It'll just make you really, really sick. And, and the fact that he wasn't, 
that that was that was fine to say that to him to say that and he said you're right Obi that's very smart you know it's a good point and it will make you sick and and then he went on to say how the ocean representing the world you can take take from the world it's not an impossible thing to do it's not like you cannot do that it's that you should not do that it's very easy to do that <laughs> and get sick and um, and and for him to be just so open with children that way. I do remember n never sort of thinking, oh, uh, Bawit shouldn't be talking to me or, or anything like, there was no uncomfortableness that his, um, his authority as, as a spiritual master, as a teacher, as my guru was such that, that he provided how to be with him. He 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 showed how to be with him just by the way that he interacted and and uh, so there was never a time when when there was any there was any barrier uh, like oh he's the teacher and I you know can't do this but at the same time there was I with with all the children I noticed um, when I was younger in the room that none of the children seemed to be disrespectful to to Bawa in any way that there was just sort of that. It demanded that just by his state of compassion. Compassion d d demands respect. to your room All the things I'm thinking about Fade just like candles burning out And all of my worries All my doubts Are swept away Like dust before a broom When I walk into your room matters for a while I never met one with quite your style like some Methuselah like a child I can't walk away when I walk into your room out in the street Everybody's saying Come on, look at me Well, it's like some prayer they're praying But when I walk Into your just want to hear you when you tell me my love you everything melts inside my heart everything keeping us apart light my way in out of the dark and I believe every word you say is true Since 
to your moon. How I long to be near you. But I just want to hear you. I'm walking to your 